Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. I'm Rebecca Irvin. I'm the director of the Rolex Mentor and Protégé Arts Initiative based in Geneva, Switzerland. Thank you. For those of you who are joining us, this talk and exhibition is part of Rolex Arts Festival, celebrating 20 years of mentoring, featuring more than 50 artists who have participated in the program over the last two decades. The Rolex Mentor and Protégé Arts Initiative allows emerging artists to spend extended periods of time in the company of senior artists for creative exchange and learning. And we do this in dance, theater, literature, music, film, visual arts, and architecture. And today we're here to look at a special exhibition designed for this festival around our architecture fellows. And I should explain a bit of history that um, in the very first cycle of the initiative in 2002 and 2003, we asked an architect to be our first visual arts mentor, and that was Alvaro Siza. And his protege is Sahel Alhiari, who's here today. However, over the development, over the years, our artistic advisors strongly encouraged us to uh, treat architecture as a separate discipline. So in 2012, with the help of a, an advise, a group of advisors, we set up a mentorship specifically dedicated to architects. So in addition to Alvaro Cis in 2002, we've had mentors as mentors Kazuo Sejima, Peter Zumtor, David Chipperfield, David Ajay, and now in the current cycle, Anne Lacaton. So I'd like to thank the Benaki, in particular, the President George Manginis, the director, and the president uh, who is here today, and Nikos Trivelidis, who's helped us immensely on this uh, partnership, and they've been very enthusiastic and uh, wonderful hosts. And we, I also want to acknowledge the, the exhibition curator, who is a, uh, the exhibition designer, who is a curator here, Natalia Bura. So we'll start this presentation with an introduction by Sir David Chipperfield, who was just, as you all know, awarded the Pritzker Prize a few days ago here in Athens. And then our Greek advisory committee member, Ilias Papagiorgio, will lead a discussion with the architects about their work. So thank you for being here, and please enjoy. David? Um, I'm just here to make, say a few points about it. First of all, clearly I must say something about the Rolex program, which is really uh, an important program. And I enjoyed enormously working with my mentor, Simon, uh, my protege, Simon, who was a mentor as well. <laughs> um, clearly we've all, as all, all mentors and proteges uh, will speak very uh, positively about their experience, and it, it clearly was an important program. For architecture, I think it's a, it's a unique chance, and it's a more difficult one because we don't have performance in the same way. The, what we work on is, is, is sort of um, more, a more complex uh, process. Uh, but in a way, it's a really important moment to think about the sort of generational dimension of uh, the mentoring program, because that's what we have the chance to do, is to talk through our experience, not always good, but certainly we're experienced, uh, and transfer our experience to others. In architecture, and I presume in the other arts, uh, practice is really fundamental to ideas. You know, ideas don't really exist uh, independent of practice. I mean, there are ideas that in, are independent of practice, but I think that <clears throat> ideas which are somehow shaped through practice are increasingly important. And at this point, where we are experiencing a real shift of priorities and concerns to do with climate change, within my own practice, I know that the way we for instance, we're trying to apply uh, concerns uh, and theories about energy, material, and all of these things. Um, the only place we can really uh, test the relevance of some of these ideas is through practice. Because as soon as you try 
to um, apply theoretical criteria by the engagement of uh, new concerns about uh, energy material, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they're only really tested in practice. So this, this discussion that one has uh, with, your, with your, your protege, I think is a really interesting one because in a way, they're asking of you things which you know about, but at the same time, uh, in a way, uh, destabilize you about the, 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 the strength of that. I think the other thing, I mean, again, I would say that the, the thing that we're learning in architecture is that the models that we have developed and the practice we have developed and the way we've developed practice um, is going to be less, less and less appropriate. Um, architecture is an incredibly collaborative process, but over the last 30 years, it has tended to be increasingly identified by singular things, thing, singular buildings, singular objects, singular architects. Um, we know that as we deal more and more with the issue of our built environment, the challenge isn't necessarily the singular buildings. Not that they're not important, uh, but the crises that we have are to do with the bits between the buildings, the gaps, uh, the spaces, the public spaces, the gaps in terms of responsibilities, the gaps in terms of administrations, the gaps between the Minister of Transportation and the Minister of Urbanism that don't talk to each other because they don't see it as a, a shared problem. We are going to need to learn to work in very different ways. Therefore, my generation looks with great uh, expectancy and, and, uh, uh, and wish towards the next generation, not to imitate us at all, but to learn from what we know from where we sit now and how we can transfer that. And of course, the paradox is, as a young architect, probably the thing you really want to do is just build something. Um, we get our thrills as architects out of building physical things. I mean, that's our reward, that's our stuff, that's our performance. And it's also our career, because we have to be noticed by this. It's a slightly rivalrous um, profession, where in order to be commissioned, we have to be identified, which accentuates our individualism as opposed to the collaborative and collective thing that we can offer as architects. The next generation, I mean, looking at many in this room, I presume, um, really have to think about that model. And I'm very encouraged uh, how the next generation is thinking in different ways. And I think it's very uh, indicative that these protégés have decided not only that they need to talk to us, but they need to talk amongst themselves, and I think that's a really fascinating uh, evolution and probably unexpected uh, evolution of the mentor-protege program. So I think this is something uh, unexpected, but I think necessarily and, and a very interesting uh, development of the mentor-protege program. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, what a week. Um, I don't remember um, when it was the last time, I think probably never, that we had so many um, architecture events in, in Athens. And uh, beyond that, we also have um, all these other events that 
Rolex Art Festival is organizing uh, in the various uh, arts. Um, once more, uh, congratulations to David Chipperfield on uh, the Pritzker Prize that was awarded this week uh, in Athens. Um, my name is Elias Papagiorgiou, and um, I'm really excited to, to be on stage with uh, five really uh, talented architects. Yang Zhao from uh, China, uh, Sahel Alhiyari from Jordan, Gloria Cabral from uh, Brazil and Paraguay, uh, Mariam Isufu Kamara from Niger, and uh, Simon Kretz from Switzerland. And um, as you probably know uh, by now, we, we are here because uh, there is also um, an exhibition with work from the five architects. So I would really like to uh, start and uh, maybe start with Sahel and ask uh, us to speak briefly about uh, the project and also why you chose the specific project in the exhibition. Uh, good evening and uh, thank you. Uh, basically, the, the, the project I chose is a residential project. It is in um, uh, Jordan and I think it, what it, it does, it represents a confluence of uh, conditions and uh, challenges uh, that, uh, uh, that the project grapples with actually. Um, the, the, the conditions range from um, the decimation of the natural uh, habitats of the, uh, the native oaks of, in Jordan to um, the, the quality of uh, uh, residential structures of, of, of that kind of uh, scale um, to the, the, the local uh, construction processes and crafts. Um, but at the forefront, really, it was uh, the, uh, uh, an issue that had to do, deal with the landscape. It is in um, an area of Amman to the west, which is a rapidly disappearing uh, oak forest. And uh, in fact, it's, it's um, important to mention that this uh, project of deforestation started with the late, late 19th century during the Ottoman period where all the oaks were uh, cut off to build the Hejaz uh, railway. And uh, this process has continued up, up, to do, up, to, up until today and actually in the last three decades uh, it became um, e extremely excessive to the point that uh, the areas are irrecognizable. So when I got this uh, site I was uh, not very excited about it really because uh, it presented a, a, a a very big challenge. Um, although there were uh, uh, protection laws for the, um, there are environmental protection laws for the forested areas, they do not comply with the building code. And so there was this uh, 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 kind of contradiction in terms of which regulation to follow. But typically, uh, the building code is the one that uh, is followed and uh, the environmental law becomes something that uh, is applicable when necessary. So there was uh, this part uh, on one side. Another part is um, the state of uh, domestic architecture of that scale um, and their exaggerated scale. Uh, of course, there, for that caliber of um, uh, residences, it's all about conspicuous consumption. They're really... Um, exaggerated in terms of everything. And uh, uh, so there was uh, that aspect to also uh, deal with and um, uh, basically uh, how to kind of propose an alternative uh, strategy for buildings of that scale. So in, in essence, what happened uh, was that um, the, the, the structure was placed in the site in a manner that does not really take advantage of uh, the, um, uh, the regulations. It, uh, uh, it, it sort of positions itself in a zone where uh, uh, in, in an empty area, so it re restricts the site even uh, more. I mean, so we had very little space to work with. And with all of that, there was the management as well of uh, the uh, um, uh, the client's expectations. Uh, but at the forefront, I think what I try to do is to kind of strip this idea of, uh, or kind of deconstruct this idea of 
um, uh, making architecture like uh, the way it's done uh, currently in Jordan, which is uh, usually the, the, the best practice is to have a structure and you dress it up with an image made out of limestone and uh, typically the, uh, you know, the images are, or, or the image that these buildings uh, have is a combination of elements and styles and so on and so forth. So here what I wanted to do is something where the structure and the image are extensions of one another. And um, at, uh, uh, another part of this was to kind of internalize the uh, substandard, substandard um, uh, construction techniques that we have and uh, to, to kind of internalize it and make it part of the design strategy. So the structure was made out of uh, 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 reinforced concrete, but then it was uh, sanded uh, by hand. Uh, uh, you know, I used the, the local um, uh, stonemasons to sand it down, giving it this kind of uh, um, effect that, uh, or surfaces that are not even imprecise. They undulate, they sort of, uh, um, um, uh, the reminiscent to kind of skin or flesh. And so it's, it's really, I think it's, uh, what interests me is not the final form. The final form, of course, is, is what it is, but it's actually what, what actually generated it, which were these conditions. Yeah. And should we assume that you have this little um, um, acorns, right? Yeah, the uh, acorns. The, the, uh, we call are them Melanidia the yeah. in Greek, um, yeah. in the exhibition. Do this relate to, to the site? Yes, it's, it, it is really kind of a commentary on this uh, deforestation project that is going on. And uh, of course, you know, at the time where, you know, um, we're facing colossal challenges with the climate, I mean, it's not really a good idea to cut off trees in a country that doesn't have a, a lot of water and climate is rising. And so, yeah, that's, that's the... And that was something from the site. I couldn't bring a piece of concrete, so... <laughs> <laughs> and um, Young, um, you're also presenting um, a house, um, so perhaps you can speak about it a little bit. Uh, yes, okay. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm very happy to be here to present my work. And uh, I chose this project uh, first because it's the uh, first uh, project and got, I got realized uh, when I, after I moved to Yunnan province and the city, now I set my practice and I live, is called Dali. It's a small city and, um, and I designed this house uh, for an artist and his wife. Um, and the house is organized around a series of courtyards, but in a quite free way. And the, and, the, and the typology of this courtyard is quite similar to, the, to its neighbors. There's a vernacular houses we can find uh, in that village and also in many villages of my city. And, um, and after they moved in, and this and the video I presented was uh, shot uh, up, uh, three and a half years after they moved in. And they really created a unique small universe in this house. And uh, it talks a lot about uh, the qualities of my city. Its climate, um, its culture, its way of life. And, uh, and this is what I want to show in this exhibition. And yeah, that's pretty much why. And you said that we are supposed to sit on the chairs, right? Yes, I, I just moved the chairs just right in front of the, the, the film so we can sit on the chair. And the chair is, I mean, the, the link to buy the chair is provided by the, by the wife of the artist. So it's actually quite similar to the ones we can find in this, in this house. So, um, let's move now to, to Paraguay. Um, Gloria, you, you're um, presenting a project there. Tell us a little bit about it and why, why you chose it. 
Thank you, Elias. For me, stay, stay here is like stay at home <laughs> because I spent four days here in this room with the students uh, making a workshop, and I really, really enjoy this process with Elias. Thank you. Thank you for this. Um, I don't have a biological child, but my buildings for me are like my children's. And Teleton for me is like my first child. <laughs> and was really intense process because we have a deadline really close that normally we have more time to develop the project and to build to, but Teleton is a foundation and have a marathon, TV marathon, and we had a short time to finish the, pro to, uh, to finish the project and the, build, the construction too. And for this, I needed to, ch to move my office for the construction place and uh, finish the project in the, in the construction mo moment and was like a really strong experience. And when you see the final uh, process, the final project, you see that the more important build that we do was built for shadow, <laughs> like in this picture. Because in Paraguay we have 50 degree in summer and we really need to build shadows before uh, come to the building. Uh, we need our conditions, but less if we build these shadows, if we protect with another uh, kind of strategy. And also this project was super important for me because we, in this uh, project, we made rehabilitation. Uh, it's a rehabilitation center for a uh, neuromotriz rehabilitation center for, child, for children. And was a rehabilitation building too, because we uh, renovate the building and take out some walls. And we, in this project, we start to reuse the, mater the demolition material that in the same place and prefabricate pieces to build an, the new walls with this same material to don't take out or, uh, and use energy to take out materials and these kind of things. For, um, yeah, I choose this project too <laughs> for this. <laughs> okay. And um, Simon, your um, project seems to be more um, would say an urban uh, scale. Um, tell us a little bit about it. Yes, I will. Hello, everybody. Very happy to be here, too, of course, as all of us. Um, after yesterday evening, I think I should have showed the, the, the highway project, of course. I'm sorry, I didn't uh, think of that. And it would have fitted well since our discussion, uh, the discussion with David was always about urbanism. But I brought another project for the exhibition, which is a, a work in progress. So it's not built yet, but it will has to be delivered next year. Um, it is a public space. So I am really interested in infrastructure or public space. Infrastructure by word means the underlying structure, the thing that holds us together, that is more or less the common ground of, what, of where we build on. So, I am very much interested in public space, in the soil, in the rain, in all those things who are somehow connecting our uh, shared interests. So this project is a public space. It's an open courtyard of an art foundation in Bern, Switzerland. So it is actually, it is privately owned, but it's publicly accessible and it's for an art foundation. So we had to find a form that is clearly um, belonging to an artistic dimension, but also is inviting and open. I chose it for a couple of reasons. First, because it's a public space, of course, as I said, I'm very interested in 
the public space. So as you will see in the exhibition, it's not only the pavilion, it's the whole, actually the, the ground, it's the, the caring of the trees, the trees are protected. Um, the building is protected too. So it's all about um, the, the whole public space as, it, as an entity. Then the second reason why I brought it is because it's an art foundation that hosts exactly, I think, 75 individual rooms for artists. So I thought it's actually a good metaphor because we are now more or less 70 no, uh, fellows. So we could all have one space. <laughs> and um, uh, the, the main question was not about the space, but about the, the, the space in between, the space where all of us could meet hang around and uh, have a creative environment. So I thought it could be something. The third uh, reason why I chose it is because it was from day one, it was a cross-disciplinary project. So we had a sociologist, um, visual artist, landscape arti uh, artist, m uh, ourselves, our office, and also an engineer. So from day one on we we were a team together and we worked on it. So I thought it's also interesting to have a cross-disciplinary project. And uh, I have a last reason, I think, well, no, two more reasons why I brought it. One is uh, because it was also a chef who was part of the team. She is uh, half Korean, half Swiss, and she explained me how to reuse old zucchini and to make kimchi and all of this kind of stuff. And I think it's interesting because the, uh, the, the, the use of the pavilion is to provide healthy food for not only the artists, but also the public. And when the pavilion is open, uh, it's like a kiosk, like an open device that serves healthy food. And when it's closed, you can sit, you, you'll see in the exhibition, you can sit in and uh, use the shelter when it rains. Sometimes it rains in Switzerland. So you can use the sheltering roof in order to, to, to listen to the chirping um, birds in the trees or other human beings if you want. And then there's the last reason, which is it's not fully financed. So if everybody in this room today <laughs> <laughs> who would like to contribute, um, I'm more than welcome and I will wait in the exhibition. Thank you very much. <laughs> I think, I think you had some fans last night at the, at the event. Um, all right, and this, this roof is really interesting. Can you, can you say something about it? And also, I also saw the stones uh, that are placed in the exhibition. Do, do, do right. somehow relate with the object? Yeah, that's true. I didn't talk about the roof. Um, well, it's a, the, the roof is a collaboration with an art, artist. Her name is Miriam Sturznecker. And she's an artist who does a lot of casting. So the idea is that in the Alps, the glaciers, they bring large pieces of rocks down the, 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 the glaciers into the rivers. Then the rocks are being, pr uh, they, they go smaller and smaller with like the force of nature. And they end up in the river Are, which is in, in Bern, as small rocks. They're like roundish. And we collect, the idea is to collect all the rocks from the riverbed because you anyways have to collect them, otherwise you dam. So, and we use that as uh, the, the, the basic material for the, for the, the concrete roof. So it's uh, on-site concrete and it should be built on the ground because the ground is full of asphalt and we want to take the asphalt away because the trees are dying because somebody put asphalt on it. So we want to have the soil again and since we take the asphalt away, we will have a ditch, and this we can use for the cast. Uh, at least we hope it will work. It's, yeah. The vacuum is a problem, but we'll see. Very nice. All right. And <coughs> Miriam, you're, you're presenting a um, very interesting, uh, it's an adaptive reuse, right? Uh, a project. Maybe tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, thank you. I think I picked this project for so many reasons. Um, one of the reasons being that I developed it right before my mentorship. It was built, it was um, the, con the construction finished right before um, my mentorship started. So in a way, the project is also almost like a marker of my evolution as an architect, so to speak, where this was sort of before mentorship. Um, but 
most importantly, well, the central reason is that it's a project that captures really all of the different issues that I tend to gravitate towards as an architect and sort of an introspection of what I tend to um, deal with or tend to focus on um, in the practice of architecture, and which a lot of times have to do with um, socioeconomic issues, um, cultural issues. And this is a project that is in a, um, in a rural area in Niger, in West Africa. And it was supposed to be, um, as you said, it's an adaptive reuse project, which means that actually the image that we're looking at is only half of the project. The other half is an older building which is made out of uh, mud, um, which was a mosque. Um, and it was built by a mason, a master mason that was very famous um, in the country and who actually turns out won an Aga Khan um, Prize for Architecture in 1986 um, by designing a similar mosque. And it was a set of um, four of them. And the village wanted to destroy that mosque and turn it into, make a concrete replica of it in the hopes that it would make for a more durable, more lasting and less uh, maintenance of a building. And then when we intervened, um, we made the argument that not only should we protect that old um, building because it's sort of um, a wonderful um, trace of traditional architecture um, for, for the region and also something that we can learn from as practitioners, as architects, um, but that we could do that, keep that building, make a new mosque, um, essentially make a little campus for under the cost um, they, they, they had and the budget that they had. And in a way, you know, this, this uh, project is one of those exercises that we often have to do in my part of the world where the cost of architecture, the price of architecture is always really central. What we do is incredibly expensive. And so it's, it's, an, it's a dimension that we always have to keep in mind. And so the idea was to create this campus almost um, in the end where we kept the old building and turned it into a library, which was incredibly contentious because this was a mosque. There was a lot of discussion back and forth in terms of how do you turn a, um, a place of worship into a secular space, and what does that mean? And then there's a discussion with this new mosque that you're looking at right now, and what that means, and the place of different parts of the society inside of that building. In the previous mosque, it was a sort of a men's world where only men really went there. And we were really interested, um, because this project was also a, col a collaboration with another colleague of mine um, who is from Iran. So it was sort of this thing where both of us were from Muslim countries, both of us were women, but we were trying to make this place of worship that is most of the time reserved for men, especially in that part of the world, and try to figure out what the place of women would be in this project. And in the end, it ended up becoming this campus for that reason, in the sense that we needed to make space for everyone, women included, but also it created this um, dialogue with the community that led us to create a place for apprenticeship, really, a place where there could be workshops, where there could be liter literacy courses, because this is a place where the literacy rate is about 15%. Um, and th these were services, or, or rather spaces, that were asked for by the community, um, where the women were really much, very much interested in workshop spaces, where they could um, learn new skills, where they can develop businesses, where they can really empower themselves. And so it just really became about this kind of dialogue and about how, what is the place of architecture in a context where you have so many different levels of challenges and how do you address them all? And also how do you address in a context of rising um, sort of almost um, extremism, which is something that we see the world around. Religiously speaking, every religion is getting more extreme. Everybody is getting more po polarized and Niger is not any different. So the project ultimately was with this dialogue between secular knowledge, religious practice, and try to figure out how to make one not contradictory to the other and how to allow them to live in harmony with each other. And I, feel, I felt that this was very much a current topic you know, um, today, again, a very universal topic at this point because of these tensions that we have everywhere and how polarized you know, the world has become. So, that's that. Um, you, you spoke a little bit about um, the cost and, and uh, the making of uh, the project. Maybe something uh, people can see more in the exhibition in, in the beautiful video, uh, but I did see some uh, impressive interior spaces with, with some curved um, arches. How, how did you achieve that? 
that was actually really um, the biggest learning point you know, of, of this project. So first, for, to, to bring back the old building to life, we were able to find the original masons who built it, who came back and redid um, the building, and we were able to sort of participate in that process by providing new ways in which the material, which was mud, um, could be um, improved somehow um, so that it didn't need as much maintenance. But then we experimented, well not experimented, this is a material that we use a lot, uh, with um, compressed earth bricks for the new building. So it's still an earth building, but in a new type of earth building. Um, and it was a collaboration with masons that we brought in from all over the country actually, who could make these, you know, you spoke about the interior images and in the exhibition you will see them in the, in the film, where they made these incredibly exquisite domes inside, um, and it was very much a dialogue of old and new, where we have this very, very strong concrete, you know, um, curved beams and, 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 um, and columns, but at the same time, you have these incredibly delicate, you know, brick domes that were made by hand, just one brick at a time, no tools, no formwork, nothing. You know, by, by these masons that were flown in from different parts of, um, I mean, not flown in, driven in from different parts of the, um, of the country. And it essentially ended up being a, a project where all the different, it was a very hybrid team from just different specialties, where everybody just walked away from this project having learned so much, having in, uh, sort of added so much to their own um, sort of arsenal as builders, as constructors. And that's, again, another benchmark that we often look for when we're working on projects, especially in places like these, where um, it's a desert area, we don't really have access to many materials, we really can use earth, recycled metal, because we have no wood, and cement. And so it was really about trying to figure out how do you make this architecture just about architecture, about spaces, about you know forms, rather than all the other things that we could do or that you know, in other parts of the world we have access to. And tactility seems to be a, a, um, a common thread, I, I feel, in all of the five projects that are uh, presented downstairs. And um, Gloria, I think you, you, I think, shared some of these um, um, concerns and process, right, with how you work uh, with materials. And uh, we recently, last week, we saw uh, your beautiful installation at the Venice Biennale. And we see also a piece of, of, uh, of the wall that is presented in, in the project, in the gallery. And so maybe we'd love to hear more about uh, how this is uh, made. Yeah, for, for when, I are, when I start to work in, in my last office in Asuncion, normally the budget is, it was 50% for material and 50% for hand worker. And, uh, but I, in the years, in other office, in other practice, the number changed and was 65% for materials and for, uh, 35 for, for uh, hand, uh, mano de obra. And we understand that if we build in this way, we will need to use more energy to produce new materials, and we always we, uh, will need to use less and less mano de obra and give less and less uh, work for the, for the people. And when we start to use this uh, uh, debris, um, we see that we have debris, uh, the demolition material in all the world. Uh, for this, we, ca we could uh, build with demolition material in Paris, in Venice, in Mexico, he also here. Uh, and the, uh, uh, sometimes we pay really almost nothing for this material, but sometimes the people p pay for us to uh, take out and, and reuse this. And when we, we prefabricate these pieces, we use uh, around 40% the concrete and 60% is the, the, the material, the existing material. And in Venice, this installation that we uh, do with Sami Balogi and uh, these years, uh, 
was a really amazing process because we don't ask for a contractor, for a normal contractor to be there. We for, go, for, we went for a, a friends who made normally uh, activism and uh, installation, something more uh, simple. And when I ask these friends, uh, I feel a little afraid because I didn't want to receive a no. <laughs> but I say, okay, they can say sinceros, sincerely with me and say that if they cannot do. But uh, I imagine this meeting and uh, they will take, they will need some time to think about if they want or not to build. An, and I ask, and before I finish the, to talk about the project, she, Julia, the, the, this team said to me, yes, we will, be, we will build this. And imagine in Venice, build with demolition material, but the, the, the material come from Venice. They go for the, with the boats, collecting this demolition material, also uh, some piece of glass, and built in in the in an underground there in Venice, take all the pieces uh, from the the workshop to the Arsenale by boat. Everything was uh, um, amazing. And uh, one thing that I decided to do before I start this process was. Because normally we say, yes, we need to enjoy more the process. It's more important the process than their final result. And, but we really don't enjoy the process normally. It's always it's so nervous. And when we saw after, oh, this time was really nice, the time of the process. We really uh, had a nice time. But, uh, here in Venice for the first time for this project, I decide to, before I start to build, I decide, okay, this will be a process with love. And we will build without fight, without, a, a, of course, have a stress, it's impossible, don't have, but we really will enjoy the process. And what's this? Well, build with friends, Sami also come to the last day to build with us, like carry some modulo with 100 kilos. And, and it's there. And now, if you see the, it's a wall. It's a wall with five centimeters, four and a half meters tall by nine, nine meters de largo. And, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Uh, it's, a, it's a simple world, 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 but if you see when the people arrive for this place, everyone wants to touch the world. I don't know why, but everyone go and touch, touch the glass and look the light. And this, I think, have another energy and was totally different. If, it will be totally different if we build with a contractor and something separate with us. And I think this connection that what, con lo que hacemos, what we uh, do, is really important to think about and recuperar. Um, um, Sahel and, and Yang, um, you, you were the First two, um, let's say, proteges participating in the in the in, initially it was a visual arts program, but it was with an architect. So you were the two first architects proteges. So, so it's been a while uh, since then. You have both um, um, an established uh, practice and career right now. Uh, so I was curious to hear maybe how uh, how the experience the exchange of uh, the mentorship program has maybe uh, affected or contributed to your career right now? Well, in, in, in my, I, th I think the, 
the greatest thing about it actually was the time that I've spent with uh, CISA, that exchange. I think um, uh, I can't tell you how it has affected my career, but definitely there was a push and uh, that, that's, that was clear. But I think the, the part which was to me more important is this idea of being able to kind of uh, have that exchange, uh, of course, with uh, a, a fantastic architect uh, uh, who has uh, was capable of sort of dissociating himself from the work he does and kind of getting into my perspective, where I come from, the context of my work, and how things are done in my country. And I think that was really incredible, that, that uh, kind of... Uh, critical capacity of, of, of seeing somebody's work and kind of pushing it in a direction that, um, um, that is appropriate to its context, right? And, um, and, and then the, the whole exchange about kind of comparing um, where I come from and challenges that I have and where he comes from and how things are done, you know, how to paint a wall in Jordan versus how to paint a wall in, I mean, it, the discussion has really went down to this kind of uh, incredibly detailed and technical and uh, uh, um, of, of, of kind of the, 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 all the, the roles an architect uh, uh, has to uh, do and understand uh, uh, in terms of building, in terms of construction, landscape, topography, climate, all of these things. That was really very interesting. But of course, you know, that, that gave me the... Uh, um, um, it was more of an internal support that allowed me to kind of uh, to uh, be persistent uh, uh, in terms of what I'm doing and, uh, and sometimes insistent on, <laughs> uh, on the work I do. And so uh, that's what I got out of it, I think. <laughs> well, and, and of course, this uh, this program had uh, helped me a lot at that moment because that's also um, the year I I decided to move to that small city where I was like the first independent architect. There is no such market, and um, I just got small opportunities to to do some experimental work, and uh, so when I got this kind of recognition, it was a tremendous help to my career. And I got to, uh, I got several projects uh, later on. And also this project itself um, brought me a very important project. Well, Sejima almost created this project, this Hongfo in Kesenuma. And also I have to thank Rolex for sponsoring this uh, building. And um, yeah, it was um, very uh, inspiring and also very intense process because the whole thing happened during 10 months from the, the first time we visited the site to the completion of the project. And Sejima didn't, she didn't tell me what to do and she just looked at my design and expressed her impressions about what I did. And when she felt something is really inappropriate, she would directly point it out. And I, oh, I just realized, but he, she never analyzed things. She just pointed out from a very, her very strong in, intuition, I would say. Yeah, I think that, that method uh, influenced me a lot. Uh, but I came to realize that quite later on, like and in the coming years, when I, when I was uh, uh, slowly uh, realizing several of my own projects, I came to realize, oh, when I design, I make decisions quite similar to what I observed from her, from, from her way. So I think, but because that, uh, that year was so intense, I didn't have really much time to reflect during the process, but later on, I came, I came to realize little by little. I think that influence 
is tremendous on me. Yeah. I, I just want to add that the, the effects actually transform with time. They, they never remain the same at the beginning, kind of when you go through this uh, mentorship process. It's one thing, and then as you kind of develop and work, uh, you, it, it completely transforms, and you start to see things that you're doing in a certain way, that, uh, and you know where that is coming from, right? So, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's, it's like a reference you can always uh, come back to, like, uh, even now, uh, because she has works all over the world, and even in China, so when you go to uh, look at his uh, recent buildings, it's like, oh, you, you think about it, and you think, oh, she would make this kind of choice, she thinks this is significant, and that she doesn't care, and this kind of uh, thinking is like always influencing my, my, my approach to design. I have we have very little time left, but I, I would like to see if someone uh, from the audience has has a has a question. Nope. Okay, maybe, maybe after um, everyone sees the the um, exhibition. But um, Miriam, I'm, I'm just one last question. I'm curious because. Um, you, you mentioned that your, your project was actually done before uh, participating in the mentorship uh, uh, program. So I would be curious to, to listen to your thoughts. Um, you were a recent, actually, uh, protege of the program and how that program has affected uh, where you are today. Um, I mean, I completely agree that it's, it's an impact that is almost like a ripple effect. You know, it's, it has one initial impact on you during the process, at the end of the process, and every year after that, you know, it, it's almost that it's forever changing you. And for me, it was, it was it's, I mean, obviously it's still ongoing. Um, the, these, these impacts are still quite strong. But it was very interesting also because I came to it, um, you know, already knowing the kind of architect I wanted to be. I already knew certain of the very specific things that matter to me um, in architecture. But it was incredibly important in helping me reaffirm those. It was also an issue of confidence. And I think it's an incredibly empowering process because it teaches you to really trust this voice that you have and not only to develop a voice and be firm in it, to trust in it um, and, and to know how to maybe even almost be kinder to yourself um, in terms of how sometimes, you know, we're our worst critic, I certainly was. And, and it was just incredibly empowering because one of the things that was dif difficult for me was that role models for someone who comes from where I come from are non-existent. And that was incredibly important. And it was having that kind of support, having, you know, beyond the exposure, but just really sort of this reaffirming of, you know, your skills are good, your voice is good, you know, here's how you develop it further, here's how you make it stronger, here's, you know, those are the things that we need. And that, that is one of the intangible things beyond, you know, just teaching you the craft, but that's actually what follows you and that's what takes you um, and propels you continuously. Thank you. Um, it, it was great to, to have you here and hear about your work. Uh, please visit the exhibition, the first floor uh, gallery. I think what is, uh, ah, you want, Simon wants to add one more thing. Sorry. But what I, what I wanted to say, and then we will end, is um, we had the opportunity to listen to the architects to, to pre that present their, their project, but um, what is very special is that the gallery, you will see five uh, films, uh, but actually there is, its architect is commenting on a, on a project of their colleagues, which I think is uh, quite uh, unique. Simon, you Well, I just want to say, I think in, in the name of all of us, thank you very much to you, Elias, Natalia, Maria, and Emma, of course. And I think in the name of all mentors and protégés, uh, Rebecca, we will miss you, and I miss you already. <laughs>